Uh, let me first ask for a show of hands how many of you are not members of NOVAC? That's great. That's great because the reason we're doing this is we want to share our passion for astronomy with the general public. So thank you all for coming out tonight. And I hope you plan to stay late. Please remember that uh, the public is allowed to stay until 11 p.m. And although it may seem slow motion at some times, there are always wondrous things up in the night sky. And we will do our bit to present them to you tonight. Uh, let me uh, mention two other things. We have two individuals who are very much to be congratulated for today's program. Uh, the first of those is our special speakers coordinator, Mike Lewis over here, who arranged for our guest. Please give him a round of applause. And out there greeting the van in the blue hat and the blue shirt is John DeRiso, and he's the overall organizer for our Astronomy Day program this year. Uh, he and a raft of volunteers have come together to put this on for you. If you happen to run into John, that's too bad, because if he's still standing there, that means you've crunched him going out tonight. Okay, a little humor there. If you happen to see John, please thank him for the program that the whole club has been able to put on. He's the guy that ramrodded it all. Uh, with no further ado, I'll ask Mike uh, to come up and introduce our speaker, and then we'll get to someone who's really interesting to listen to. Thank you, Rob. Well, welcome, everybody. This is uh, a labor of love. We're glad to have you all with us. Uh, this is Novak's 25th anniversary year. We're one of the largest astronomy clubs in the country. That means a lot, I think, to our organization. We're uh, about 900 strong in building, and in commemoration of that wonderful milestone, uh, we're bringing in some uh, notable figures in the amateur astronomy world this year, beginning with Rod Melise. Rod is the expert on a type of telescope that's perhaps, I think, one of the, one of the better designs, uh, enduring designs, the schmidt Cassegrain, and uh, certainly one of the older designs out there. He's going to talk all about it. He's the expert. He's written a book on uh, the schmidt Cassegrain telescope, and uh, you can get that off of the internet, as well as I'm sure many other sources. Um, he'll be talking about his interest there. He is also a writer, a prolific writer, among uh, amateur, amateur astronomy publications, the latest being Night Sky, which is geared toward the beginner. And a lot of you guys are new to the hobby, I believe, so uh, Rod will uh, be of interest to you. He's written the cover story for the latest edition of Night Sky, which is uh, the March-April edition, uh, Let's Party. So he's certainly a happening kind of guy and a, a fitting person to begin this evening's program. Without further ado, fellow Alabamian Rod Melise. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. And yeah, who is ready to party? Yeah. Howdy, y'all. How you doing? Sure is good to be here. Sure is good. I get a funny feeling every time I ride on airplanes these days. Maybe it's just because uh, I'm a child of the 60s, but something about being surrounded by 10 uniform people uh, in Mobile, Alabama, just does not go with me. I know they're here to protect us and all that. Yeah, uh, whatever. Uh, at any rate, I suppose I'm lucky that nobody has come up with a do not fly list for rednecks. Then I would be in trouble. <laughs> By the way, while I've got y'all's attention, what is this? They give me this on the airplane for breakfast, and it says it was wholesome and chewy. It sure was chewy. Uh, any of you who can identify what this was made out of, please see me after the program. I did eat one of these. I was afraid to eat the second one without knowing. <laughs> anyway, enough of that nonsense. Let's get started. Uh, we're here to talk telescopes. I'm going to be talking a certain kind of telescope, and I know there are some novices out there who will say, what in the heck is he going on about? And, uh, well, that's your problem. But uh, rest assured, if I get through my many, many slides, I will take plenty of questions, and you can ask anything you like, only not too personal, please. It might get back to my wife. You know how she is. Anyway, the subject tonight is the past, present, and future of the schmidt cassegrain telescope. For the uninitiated, a schmidt cassegrain is one of these things uh, that you'll see out on the field. What does it look like? It doesn't look much like what you think a telescope ought to look like. That is a long tube. It looks like a beer keg on a tripod. And maybe that's what attracted to me to it in the beginning, but that's another story. 
basically it's a telescope that uses lenses and mirrors to make an image. Anywho. Oops, there you go. Do you like cats? Yeah. Three-footed or four, four? Yeah, let's hear it for the kitty cats. But uh, we're talking tonight not about our four-footed friends, uh, you know, with apologies to this stout fellow, but two three-footed cats. What is he talking about? Uh, that same telescope I was telling you about that is one that uses mirrors and lenses to produce images is known as a cat, short for catadioptric. That sounds like a stupid old five dollar word, but the meaning is simple. It just means a telescope that uses lenses and mirrors. And uh, there was a time when these telescopes were new to astronomy, but now they have a real history, much of it being pretty girls being used to uh, advertise telescopes in lieu of dorky looking fellows. Uh, and yes, I do not go through a presentation without uh, talking about pretty girls unless my wife gets on to me and then I will stop. She's not here. But I'll try not to be too politically incorrect. Where did these telescopes come from? Well, they're called Schmidt Cassegrains and they came from two folks way back when in the earlier 20th century, Schmidt and Cassegrain. But more than anything else, they came from a man named Tom Johnson out in California whose goal was to build a nice portable telescope. <laughs> that doesn't look portable to you? Well, it, it, it was portable uh, for the day. If you could have seen what an 18.5 inch telescope normally looked like back then, yes, that was portable. At any rate, this was a man who was the president of a small electronics company, Valor Electronics, who wanted to build telescopes for himself and his children and got carried away. He went on to uh, start a company called Celestron that many of you are familiar with. And lots more words on them and the current state of them a little later. This is what we all wanted way back when, 65, 66, all us geeky kids who were into this astronomy stuff wanted a Celestron C10, like this, uh, the king of the nerds here is looking through. Uh, of course, we could not uh, even begin to afford one. Uh, that didn't mean we didn't want it, though. This is the Down with Love telescope. Who saw this? I, I'm not talking about Mrs. Elwiger. Who saw this movie? Uh, Whoever researched it, it was an homage, homage, if I may say, to uh, the Doris Day Rock Hudson films, wanted a telescope in the movie. They actually had a classic Celestron from 1964 or 65. Uh, it was easy to look at. It was beautiful. I mean the telescope. But these were telescopes for small colleges, for wealthy people. They were not for the average amateur astronomer until 1970 when they came out with this wonderful telescope that's called the orange tube. Can anybody tell me why it was called the orange tube? It has an orange tube. At any rate, this was something you could dream of. It cost $1,000, give or take, in great big old 1970 dollars. I was a missile launch officer at the time, living off Uncle Sam, and I could finally afford a new telescope. Can I tell you all a story about choosing telescopes and what you think you want and what you really might want? When I was a young sprout, and I think Phil Harrington probably felt the same way, the one telescope I wanted was a telescope called a cave. It was a Newtonian reflector. You've seen some like it out on the field with a big long tube. Legendary optics, and I thought it was the cat's meow, even if it wasn't a cat. I bought me one. Then I discovered something really quickly. It's no fun taking a telescope with a five or six foot tube up into the Ozark Mountains in the middle of winter time. <laughs> this telescope I thought I wanted so much and was gonna be so wonderful wasn't what I wanted or needed after all. This turned out to be what I wanted and what I needed. It had large aperture, for those days anyway, my gosh, eight inches, and it was portable. It was about two feet long. It fit in the back of my MGB, folks. I didn't have to stick the tube out the window. 
That was the beginning of my love affair with three-legged cats that has endured until this very day. Celestron was cool. People wanted to copy it, copy them, compete with them. If you ever see a telescope like this, do not buy it. It was junk. This company, Criterion, made some wonderful reflecting telescopes, but they did not quite get the formula for the SCT, if I may call the schmidt cassegrain that down. They came and they eventually went. By the way, you'll notice I'm not using notes. That's because I left the notes in the car with my wife. But I don't like them anyway. I make it up as I go along. Uh, I've yet to figure out what exactly Miss was doing with a C8 at the beach. <laughs> I don't know. But the point of this little slide is that Celestron enjoyed many years of dominance in amateur telescopes. Until Mead came along. Who's heard of Mead? Raise your hand, come on. Even I see novices clearly out there who have heard of me. They are a great success story. They, uh, if I may, copied the Celestron idea, but they did it much better than Criterion, uh, and they have been a big force in amateur telescopes ever since. If you're interested in technical stuff, see me after, and I'll go into the minutiae. But uh, here we have Celestron trying to catch up. And that has been the story with these telescopes. schmidt cassegrains are telescopes unlike most other kinds that are only produced by two companies, Mead and Celestron. They're two small companies, they have the same customer base, and they sell a nearly identical product. So what it usually boils down to is who has the coolest looking ad. Do you like this better? Can I see of hands? Show of hands? Or do you like this one better? All the guys have raised their hands for this one. That's okay. That's okay. And the 1980s went on, and not everybody wanted an 8-inch telescope. An 8-inch telescope's big. Even an SCT is big. Your wife might not want that, or your husband might not want that in the living room where I keep my scopes. So you could get something a little smaller, like this kitten, or that kitten, or if you're obsessive compulsive like your old Uncle Rod, you got something like that. <laughs> then a bad thing happened. Who was around in this crazy game for Common Halley? Quite a few of you. The thing was, it was we thought it was an amateur astronomer's dream come true. Everybody was into astronomy. Everybody wanted a telescope. Then two unfortunate things happened. Uh, for one, the comet was, i got to admit, sort of a flop. Yeah, it certainly wasn't what people had been led to believe it would be from long exposure photographs from the turn of the century. That was one thing. The other thing was the telescope companies went crazy. Mead and Celestron built telescopes until they wore out their workforces and wore out their tools and started producing optics that were, shall we say, something less than good. Also, they wore out the patience of the public who just wanted to look at the comet and was being sold these things that didn't do that very well at all. And there followed a depression in amateur telescopes and in SCTs. And sometimes I think this is why, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, you amateurs out there, you experienced amateurs, know what I'm talking about when I say the SCT has had a bad reputation for a long time. Am I right? Yeah. Undeserved in my opinion, but that bad reputation comes from Halley scopes, scopes built in huge numbers, thrown out the door uh, without much regard to quality, and both companies were guilty of it. Uh, it also saw the end of the Criterion telescopes for all time. They'd been sold out to Bosch and Long. As is often the case of amateurs in amateur astronomy, though there was irony here. This Bosch and Lom 8-inch telescope, if you ever see one, buy it, it's great. But uh, they decided they didn't want to have anything to do with crazy amateur astronomers, and there was much better uh, profit and sanity involved in selling binoculars, rifle scopes, and 60-millimeter telescopes to department stores, and they were right. There's also one more player. This is what I'm after. Has anybody seen one of these? You need to give it to me. I'm after it. 
This is a Takahashi SCT. I bet you refractor snobs did not know that Takahashi, your beloved company, made lowly Schmidt Cassegrains. Yes, sir, they did. The TSC 225, a 9-inch Schmidt Cassegrain that we thought was the cat's meow, literally. Problem was, I think this was about 1988, 89 time frame, maybe 90. My, my brain is going, luckily that's the only thing. Uh, it cost $4,000 with no mount, just the telescope. and It failed miserably. The reason being, I think, was that people who had the money to uh, buy a Takahashi scope for $4,000 did not want to dirty themselves with a Schmidt Cassegrain. The saps. Uh, but what happened? What really, 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 really happened in the 80s that had a huge impact on amateur astronomy that continues to be felt today was that somebody built a telescope with GoTo. A telescope with a computer that automatically points at anything. Want to see a galaxy? Push a few buttons. Want to see a planet? Push a few buttons. Somebody built one. Who was that somebody? Me? Did somebody say me? Eh, we have some nice partying gifts for you. Oh, come on. Ah, uh, eh, there it is. Celestron built the first commercial go-to scope, the CompuStar. There was a problem with this. They wanted $22,000 for a 14-inch scope. And that was the main thing wrong with these. They were not perfect, but the stories that you experienced amateurs have heard about them were somewhat inaccurate. They did work fairly well. I used a C14 CompuStar at the Texas Star Party recently, and it worked quite well within certain parameters. Uh, they just cost too much. They just cost too much. What else went on after Halley? Mead decided they were going to try an SCT of a new type, sort of like a party of a new type. We've heard that before. Uh, the LX6, most Schmidt cast grains have a focal ratio of F10. What that gobbledygook means is they produce normally high magnifications. Real great for looking at the moon and planets, not so hot for looking at big star clusters. Mead came along with a telescope that was uh, F6.3. Showed you wider views of the heavens. And we thought that was pretty cool at first, but then reality set in. It being that it was hard for me to mass produce these optics uh, and continue to provide the quality that they had with their older telescopes, the F10 telescopes. Uh, also what it was found out was that the addition of a small lens for about $100 to an F10 SCT did the same thing that the expensive LX6 did and me kept trying to do F6.3 for quite a few years and eventually gave up. Ah, Celestron. I don't know where they got this dude. Does that look like a... Does that look sort of like Dobie Gillis's evil twin? I don't know. But this is one thing that shows how much amateur astronomy has changed. What excited the heck out of us back in the 80s? Hey, guess what? They're coming out with a telescope that works on a battery. You don't have to lug a car battery around anymore. Uh... That was technological advance to us back then. No computers. You didn't have to lug around your car's battery. Celestron continued doing what Celestron did, making nice telescopes. A lot of you have heard of the Ultima series. A lot of people called them photographer's telescopes. They were very good, but not very exciting. But Meade, if nothing else, had an idea what was exciting. And this is really the telescope that changed everyone. Everybody say its name. LX200, LX200, LX200. Not the perfect scope, but a breakthrough nevertheless. A telescope that would actually do what the CompuStar promised and did. Push a button and you see stuff. Push a lot of buttons and you see a lot of stuff. But what they did was do it for not too much money. Believe you me, 1995 in 92 was still a lot of money for a lot of people but it wasn't twenty two thousand dollars it was not again the perfect telescope but it was different and it was exciting 
this telescope has probably excited more people than any other telescope that has ever been produced for the amateur. And some people will disagree. Let's fight. I'm sticking to my guns. Uh, and even then, though, it was you go back and look at these old ads, it would automatically go to 700 objects, many of which were stars. Now your average department store telescope will go to 30,000, even if you can't see any of them. Uh, and Mead kept rolling right along. A lot of people like this little thing. This was the 2045 4-inch SCT. You thought I was going to say ETX, didn't you? The joke's on you. Their small SCT. Who's that? I don't know. That's more like it in my opinion, but I'm politically incorrect. I admit it. Sorry. I ain't going to change, probably. That's what my wife says and then just shakes her head. Uh, Celestron didn't know what to do. It had become the perception in the public mind that they did not do electronics nor computers very well at all or know anything about them, even though the reality was that they had at least had some hand in the development of the first computerized scope. They thought it would be a good time to bring out a cheap C8, and that was what most people thought about it. It was cheap. Now this telescope excited a lot of folks and still does today. This is the C9.25 tube assembly. And you could, could then and now get it on a variety of mounts, but some people consider this to be the best schmidt cast grain optics set ever produced then or since. And if you want to know why, bring me $10 after the program and I'll tell you. But this was the main thing that Celestron did in the 90s, the early to mid 90s. Unfortunately, that was not very exciting for most people. Heck, Mead's got a 10! Who cared if the optics were wonderful? So Celestron said, why don't we make a telescope that goes to stuff? And they came out with this thing. Uh, the physics department where I teach has one, and it's not a bad scope. It's a sweet little scope. You can't take pictures very well with it, and it doesn't like going to planets, but otherwise it's a pleasant scope. It's nice and light, and it has some... Uh, interesting features. It didn't exactly take the world by storm. Uh, but Mead wasn't perfect either. They came out with the LX50 and it was the first non-go-to scope to show that uh, you can mess up the computers on a non-computerized scope. Don't ask. This is a scope that a lot of folks love. This is the little baby. I see them at star parties everywhere I go. And their owners love them very, very much. They're small. Even with the five inch, you're somewhat limited uh, in what you can see in deep space. But they're inexpensive. The optics are almost universally excellent. And they have lots of go-to computer whiz-bang, hook to a PC, look at numbers flashing stuff. How many ETX owners out there? We got any? One, two, three, four. Gracious. Oh, uh, you know, there's nothing bad to say about it other than the fact that it's small. And please save your questions to the end. We're rolling right along. Poor old Celestron. This was the first time they got themselves. Well, sort of the second time, but I won't go into that. The first time they got themselves into real trouble, they ran out of money and got bought out by Tasco. Who knows what Tasco was? It was considered the evil side of astronomy, the company that made the, the um, 60 millimeter department store refractors that they designed for you to point at the sun and burn your eyes out with. <laughs> so you can imagine, we thought it was all a joke when somebody came on the internet and said, hey, Celestron owners, your scope's really a Tasco. Alas, it was true, or maybe not. The alas, I mean. Celestron has had a problem for the last, oh, 15, 20 years, 20 years maybe, a lack of capital. And that problem became worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Tasco allowed them to develop their own go-to scopes, the next stars. They worked quite well, and people really liked, starting with a 5-inch. Uh, it was sort of like the ETX, 
but it used Schmidt Cassegrain accessories. It was reasonably priced, it was rugged, and it had very good optics itself. But guess what? Tasco must have bought too many rifle scopes or something. They went bankrupt and Celestron was getting ready to go under. Again. It turned out to be a good thing at the time anyway because Celestron was then bought out by three of the people in its management who had long experience with the company. Alan Hale, Joseph Lupica, and Rick Hedrick. They did a lot of good things. They came out with this puppy. This is my current favorite personal scope, the Next Star 11. C11, nice and big, uh, almost frightening, bit, frighteningly big when you look at one for the first time, but guess what? Celestron did something Meade had never thought of. They actually put handles on the scope that you could use, which meant you can lift this 60 pound scope onto its tripod even if you're as weak, decrepit, and broke down an old hillbilly as I am. Lots of people hear about GPS vis-a-vis -vis telescopes. That's the buzzword. Is it good or bad? It's, uh, good. it's great for lazy people. Uh, if you, like I do, are lazy by nature, it's great. And if you, like me, travel to a lot of star parties in wonderful places like this, it's double great. So I don't have to look up the latitude and the longitude. I don't have to look up the time on my stupid watch, which I can't read anyway. I don't have to remember what date it is. I don't remember have to figure out which star is where. I turn it on and I say, okay. And it points at two stars and I center them and I'm good to go for the rest of the night. Frankly though, if you're not as lazy as I am, you just observe from home. You don't need GPS. A regular go-to scope is Fine, if you do not mind going through the dreary drudgery of figuring out the time and punching that in the buttons. Of course, now some people are like I am and can't program a VCR, so GPS is probably a good thing for us, and you don't have to identify yourselves. Uh, ergonomic handles, slip rings. Anybody ever worked in radar? I thought it was a great idea. No more cord wrap on the telescope. Unfortunately, they forgot one thing. If you live where the dew is heavy, you have to attach a heater to the corrector plate and slip ring fancy stuff or not, the cords all wrap around your telescope and pull out the power cord and you start crying and stuff. So that's the way it goes. Uh, is anybody interested in gems? Some are, yeah. Well, I don't know. Don't ask me because I don't know. These are two more of Celestron's scopes. And as you can see, that Celestron, one of the things they tried to do to differentiate themselves, that's isn't that what the marketing experts say, we got to differentiate ourselves, is maybe aiming their stuff at a higher class of amateur astronomers. Uh... They also make telescopes, however, to appeal to the penny pinchers among us, the 5 and 8i. Very reasonably priced. In fact, this is representative of the big problem with schmidt cassegrains This telescope will go to 40,000 objects, or those of the 40,000 you can see, right? has a wonderful tube with wonderful coatings and everything else, and basically it costs the same or less than my first C8 did in 1975, which means it's kind of hard to keep your business going under those uh, terms because their customer base is not that much bigger than it was in 1970. Some, but probably not five or ten times. Uh, well, the solution to that, you take your tube, Bubba, you buy your mount from China, you put a computer on her. Does it sound like a recipe for disaster? Yes. Yes. Bam, nice parting gifts for you. Actually, it works very well. I recently bought one of these mounts uh, to put a C8 on. Why? Because I'm old and decrepit and I don't want to carry around a C11 or a C14 to star parties. What amazed me when I wasn't expecting much 
This thing, if you set it up properly, it goes to its go-to's about as well as the Medes and other Celestrons go to their go-to's. This was a sad, sad, sad event in my life. The first of the, the last, excuse me, of the original type of Schmidt Cassegrain. One that just had a little motor, tracked the stars, no computer, no lights, no female voices talking to you, no display screens, was discontinued. Uh, the Meet LX-10. This is what I use with my astronomy students, and I don't know what I'm going to do after that. Uh, I don't think they're worthy of go-to, but I'll figure that out at some point. Clearly, Mead and Celestron think we all want computer telescopes, and I suspect they're right. Uh, Mead discontinued and continued and did this and that like the other telescopes they've offered over the years. But this is the big news from them, or it was the big news yesterday, a GPS telescope of their own. Big surprise. One has GPS, and the other company decides they want GPS to nice telescope nevertheless. They also got this bright idea. They sat in a meeting and said, guess what? I've got a great idea. We take one of our tubes, Bubba, but guess what we're going to do? We're going to buy a mount from mainland China and put it on there. Theirs works fairly well, too. Theirs works fairly well, too. But this was, like I said, what we waited for, the Mead LX200 GPS. Or we thought that was what we were waiting for anyway. We didn't know what we were waiting for. We were all confused. Where? Will there be any SCTs? Will there be any more SCTs? I don't want to bring tears to the eyes of the SCT fans, but that's a definite question at this point. What can we? What might we see? Perhaps the toast star. <laughs> if you observe until breakfast, some of us do. How about the mixed star? sell brownies to the Girl Scouts. My personal favorite. Last time I spoke to Alan Hale, he said someone had put this up on the bulletin board at Celestron, and he didn't know if he was overly happy about it or not. That's probably what you'll see, though. And that's, that's coming along apace. Vixen, the Japanese company, also actually has a mount very much like that even now. Actually, it runs Linux, so that's for Super Geek! But that brings us back to how many, how many features can you put on a telescope when the public says, I ain't buying a telescope for more than 1500 bucks. I don't care what it is. Eventually, they're going to have to come from China. Like that nice little one. That's a Skywatcher, but it's the same as the telescope sold by Orion. Actually, it's not an SCT. It's a Maxitov Cassegrain. It's very similar. It's a very good performer. It shows how far uh, Chinese technology and telescopes have come. It's a nice little telescope. Uh, what won't we see? Probably not premium SCTs, at least if you call them SCTs. Nobody in their right mind is going to buy a proletarian telescope like an SCT if you call it an SCT. Uh, that's a bunch of gobbledygook of my own devising. How about one of these? Celestron thought they'd make one. I don't know if they actually will. A C20? I suspect not. What do I want? All I wanted were built-in dew heaters. This is a picture of my telescope at Chiefland, Florida. What you cannot see is that at this point my telescope tube is still raining. If you don't know what I'm talking about with telescopes and do, bring me $10 after the presentation. I'll illuminate you. This is the news, though. This is the big daddy. This is the big dog. Mead's new telescope, the RCX400. How many have heard of it? Just about everybody who picks up an amateur astronomy magazine, because Mead, in their wisdom, has run probably more full-color, full-page ads than General Motors. Maybe that's what's wrong with General Motors these days. This is the RCX 400, and it's got everything on it except, well, we won't go into that. 
but it has everything we asked for. It has a built-in heater to keep dew off. It has USB ports instead of serial ports. It doesn't focus by moving the main mirror so your images don't do this when you focus. What is it though? They say it's a kind of telescope called a Ritchie Credian. The only problem is if you read the design specs and if you try to question Mead, it becomes obvious that it's a variant on the SCT. It uses a spherical primary mirror and a corrector plate. I don't care what anybody says, to me that's an SCT. Can I hear it? That's an SCT. Take that, Mead. It may be a very good telescope. I hope it's a wonderful telescope. I want them to succeed, but I don't call that a Richie Creechian. I call that an extra special super SCT. And then there was some restaurant. Not this again. Well, we think we might go out of business and you'll never get your telescope serviced again and never buy any pots. Same thing, lack of capital. These three dudes bought the company and didn't have enough money to fully capitalize it and Celestron was going bankrupt again with a little help from Mead's legal department. If you want more details, bring me $10 after the presentations and I'll fill you in. The long and short is Celestron's been bought out by a Chinese telescope company, Senta, the company that makes the short tube 80, uh, the company that makes many of the telescopes Celestron and Orion So. The, uh, the reaction among U.S. amateurs, running around like chickens with their heads off, back and forth. The man who owns Senta, the man who founded Senta, is very knowledgeable about telescopes, and he's not likely to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. In fact, uh, he may be able to help Celestron in spite of themselves. They're endeavoring to persevere. They came out with a new telescope that they, this was announced basically before the bankruptcy problem, the latest bankruptcy problem. Uh, it's being sold as the latest and the greatest. Obviously it's a version of a Celestron telescope that somebody didn't lose a lot of sleep designing. I mean, look at that base. I mean, as far as looks, uh, it's called the CPC. Celestron Professional Computerized. Yeah, right. It might be a good scope, but basically what this is is the GPS scope's cheapened. And maybe that's what they need to do. If people don't want to pay more, you got to cheapen. Am I going to buy one? I never buy a telescope first time out. What is my final prediction, though? In spite of Meade and Celestron, in spite of their very best efforts, the schmidt cassegrain will continue to be the most popular and useful amateur telescope of all time and better than any of the others. I'm not going to listen to somebody saying no, so don't even think about it. If you really want to pay, learn more and you don't think paying me $10 after the end of the presentation is a good idea, buy my book. There's a bad thing about that, though. Guess where my book is, or my copies of the book are? with my wife and the notes. So I'm not totally embarrassed. The good people at Novak are giving away copies of Night Sky with my article in it. If you want to read my deathless prose, pick these up. They're free. The procedure is pick up the magazine, tuck it under your arm, come over to me and give me $10. <laughs> That's not so much to ask, is it? Somebody out there said, money well spent! This is my next one in 2006. Something I've had an idea for for a long time because how many of us live under dark skies? How many of us want to observe star clusters, nebulae, and galaxies? I'm not kidding. There is a lot to be seen. Not as good as living out in the desert, but you can see stuff other than the moon. I actually don't make you buy anything to learn about SCTs. You can go to that address and you can sign up for my SCT user mailing list. And we'll just abuse you, but we will give you some information. Of course you're going to be abused. 
To make up for me torturing you, though, here's a freebie. If you're interested in double stars, a few colleagues of mine and I have set up a new double star journal out of the University of South Alabama Physics Department. Uh, this is the URL, or you can just go to my website. Guess what? It's free. Although I do have a special procedure. Once you download it, email me uh, PayPal for $10. <laughs> Why $10? It's just a good round figure. <laughs> you knew, those of you who know me, knew I wasn't going to go by without mentioning the Celestron girls. This is the very first Celestron girl. Miss says she's going to a party, a star party that is and that her telescope will fit in her compact car, which is a 65 Mustang. You know what we find amusing about this is not her. She's a nice young woman, obviously. Have you ever tried to lift a C-10? <laughs> yeah, she's hefting it with, you know, we figure either she's some kind of a mutant, or, you know, isn't that about the time the X-Men were formed? Or that's a balsa wood C-10. Well, she's allowed to do that. And this is the main homage to these Celestron girls. Will we see more of them? I hope so. I'm tired of geeks and white coats and junk like that again. Get over it, telescope companies. I don't want nerds and geeks and white coats. Jeez. And that's self-explanatory. You think I've got mean Celestron right, or do you think it should be the other way? I think that's right. <laughs> Shut up, Beavis. Now is the best time of all, where you get to do the talking, I get to show you where you're wrong. For ten dollars, of course. This is a sharp individual. Okay, let's have it. Sir. Um, so why do you like the uh, Schmitz over the mix? Do you have any idea how much I like money? An 8-inch Mac costs how much? I think Tech will give you one for three or four thousand dollars for the tube. I can get an 11-inch Schmidt Cassegrain for the same amount. And I'm not being facetious. A Maxutov is a wonderful telescope, capable of that whatever they want to call it refractor-like performance. Ah. The problem being the corrector plate. It's made out of a thick chunk of glass that makes it expensive. Plus, they're generally sold as premium telescopes to appeal to a premium market. I'm talking about telescopes like the AP Maxitov. I'm talking the vaunted Questar. Uh, I've always preferred bigger more than better. That's just me. It might not be you. The other thing that's always attracted me, the schmidt Cassegrain too. well, two things. One is its faster focal ratio, F10, and the fact that uh, that can be easily reduced to f6.3 or even f3.3 or even for certain celestron telescopes for f2. What does all that gobbledygook mean? It just means if you like to take pictures of the sky especially your telescope can take in wider swaths of it than a Maxitov. I also like the fact that the Schmitt, Schmitt Cass... I can't even say it. The Schmidt Cassegrain is the personal computer of telescopes. It's the IBM PC of telescopes. What do I mean by that? Browse through the magazines and catalogs. Any accessory that you can think of that has ever been made for a telescope is probably available for a Schmidt Cassegrain, and it's standard to the rear threads on the SCT. Spectroscopes, video cameras, you name it. Uh, the Maxitovs have always been special telescopes for the sophisticated elite. And if there's one thing nobody has ever accused me of being that sophisticated. Next. Come on, somebody else wants to be abused. Come on. Sir? If you could buy one of the older generations, if you were a newer uh, amateur astronomer, an older version, a used version, if you will, of an SCT, which one would you buy? That would depend on how much money I had to spend. If I had to spend... If I only had, let's say, $500 to spend, you can pick up the orange tube C8s, which were made in great numbers from 1970 to, oh, I think 1982, uh, for about that much or maybe even less sometimes. They are good telescopes. 
They're not great telescopes, despite what people want to say these days. These days, folks want to make them into classics. They were not classics. They're good tools. They do suffer in several ways uh, against the most recent celestrons. That is, they don't have modern coatings. Images are noticeably dimmer. And it will not be your imagination in an orange tube or other early Schmidt Cassegrain. Uh, you have to plug them into the wall or a 12 volt battery, which all of that is not meant to dissuade. They can be wonderful telescopes. But if I had to look around, if you're asking me what I would look for in a U. Schmidt Cassegrain, I would look for a Mead or Celestron built from 1990 to 2005, maybe 1991. You want one that's got a few features, for God's sake. Plus, you want one that does not suffer from Halley-itis. Comet Halley was here in 1985-86. It basically took Mead and Celestron until about 1991 to recover. Uh, if you want an orange tube, get one. The price will be right, and uh, you can be assured they won't suffer from the Halley problems, although not all of them were great optically, despite what you're told. Next. Yes, sir. In the back, I think you were first. You'll be next. You. Yes, sir. What about fast star capability? To change the front fast star capability was very interesting, and I alluded to that early, ba earlier. Basically, you can remove the secondary mirror of a Schmidt Cassegrain and screw a CCD camera on there. Some CCD cameras. There are two limiting factors or three limiting factors with Fast Star. First, you got to care about such a thing. Second, you got to be willing to spend money because you just can't take the mirror out and put the camera in. As is mostly often the case with everything built in America, there's extra cost option. You have to buy a corrective optic set that's rather expensive. Uh, you can do that and you can put your telescope on that Fast Star position and take some amazing photos if you can find a fast star telescope. Celestron appears to be in the throes of eliminating that option, obviously to save money because it was something that was not very interesting to the general amateur. Few used it. And uh, for example, the Celestron Next Star 11 came with a fast star so style secondary. You could unscrew it, pull it out, and set it aside, but they never made the corrective optics set. A third party did, but well, whatever. Celestron is not going to be allowed to continue doing something like that, I fear. When you take it out and put it back in, does it all colony? Yes. Yes. It's, it's really rather well designed. Actually, however, I found a good use for fast star optics. I had my C11 out one night, and guess what happened? Mr. Bug crawled inside. <laughs> Mr. Bug crawled inside. I had the rear port cover off, and... You know, with a C11, it's a big one, and he crawled right inside. What am I going to do now? Now, I'm not afraid of taking off a corrector. I'll take a corrector off with the best of you. I'll take one off with one hand tied behind my back. But that does take a little time, and you've got to find a screwdriver or an Allen wrench. But I found I could take uh, the uh, Fast Star Secondary out and put a soda straw in there and get Mr. Bug to crawl up it, and everything was okay. So there is a use for it. <laughs> Ron's automatic bug remover. I think I, like most amateur astronomy entrepreneurs, I think I'll sell uh, silver spray painted soda straws for 50 bucks. Must have fast star option. Sir. Well, sort of out there, have you seen any um, unidentified, unidentified flying objects flying around in the sky? I assume you're talking about when I'm sober. <laughs> hmm, when have I been sober of late? Other than that, this afternoon I don't know, and it does hurt. I'm just trying to keep looking at my watch so I can, you know, give Phil Harrington the jitters. Always get like that. How long is he going to keep talking? With me, you never know. Have I seen any unidentified uh, uh, UFOs? Is that what you're asking me? I've seen bunches of them. Have I seen any alien spacecraft from Zeta Reticuli 2 that want to uh, do bad things to me? No. I've seen some pretty amazing looking things. Uh, the average person, or even someone special like me, who's laughing? I want their names. 
Uh, you see an airplane in an unusual aspect, it can look truly weird. Down where I live, uh, we're next door to Eglin Air Force Base almost. Guess what they do in Eglin Air Force Base? I can tell you, but then I have to kill you. That kind of stuff. And they'll do things like send a C-130 out over inhabited areas and drop anti-ECM uh, flares. That looks just like the mothership and the little baby alien gray ships. I've seen a lot of UFOs, but I did not ever and have not ever seen one that I could not logically explain as something normal. Is that a good enough answer? I didn't say that little aliens from Zeta Reticuli 2 weren't interested in me and doing nasty things to me, ah, just that I've never seen such. I've seen a lot of weird stuff, and I've heard a lot of weird stories over the last, you know, 40 years I've been involved in this foolishness. I, I didn't mean that. It's not foolish. Not, it's the greatest thing in the world. Uh, but I've never seen anything that I couldn't uh, posit an explanation for. Fair. Next. Yeah, you've done quite a few travels with your telescope. Yes. I try. I choose to travel with my telescope more so than anyone else. In the eastern U.S., one of the darkest spots I've ever seen, and this is going to be like telling y'all to go to uh, Siberia, I guess. Anywhere, anywhere. Period. In the eastern United States has been in northern Mississippi. I know there's some dark space up in uh, the Smokies, right? Everybody's been on vacation in the Smokies, wanted to go out and look at the stars. They call them the Smoky Mountains for a reason. They're smoky! You can't see nothing. If you go down to Mississippi, to French Camp, Mississippi, which is on the Natchez Trace, way north of Jackson, you'll find two things. One of which is there's basically no one there. Why is that? Nobody wants to be there. There's nothing to do there. I went up to French camp and there was still a general store. And there was a bench. And there were two guys sitting out on the bench. One was whittling. Another one was spitting. I sat down. About 15 minutes passed and one said, Nice day. About 30 minutes later, the other one said, yep. <laughs> That's when I left. But seriously, yeah, the skies were incredibly dark. Uh, magnitude 7 plus at the zenith. And that's not the only place in the eastern United States by any means. That's just an example. But there's a drawback to that. Can anybody tell me what that is? Skeeters. No, actually there were no skeeters in uh, French Camp, Mississippi in March. Don't ask me why I was stupid enough to go to French Camp, Mississippi in March. That's another story. But there were no Skeeters. The drawback was you were east of the Mississippi. One thing I've come to realize over the years, and I've gone through periods of time when I've run hot and cold on the deep sky. I always like at least casually looking at nebulae, galaxies, etc. But, you know, over the years and maybe a lot more recently, I've been more interested in the planets and double stars where you don't need real dark skies or dark skies at all most of the time. But one thing I've realized when it comes to looking at the deep skies, I don't care where the heck you go in the eastern United States, it's never going to be very good. Not compared to the west. Why is that? Because I don't know of any place in the eastern United States where it's truly dry. Not dry like it is out in the west. Of course, out in the west it's dusty and that's another story, but believe me, you'll always see more out there than you will over here. How good does it get? It gets amazingly good. I've seen the double quasar with a 12 inch at the Texas Star Party. That may not mean diddly squat to most of you, but let me put it this way. Uh, I was out there with David Levy one night, and David, he's an old guy. He's, he's what would you say, uh, Phil, about 80 years old? You can tell him I said that next time you see him. He said, Rod, you know what? And I said, what? He said, I believe the Milky Way looks as good from here as what I remember back in the 50s when I was a kid in Canada. And he looked a little more and he said, no, I've seen, I've never seen it this good, ever. It's just a totally different experience 
from a dark location. The Milky Way isn't something you can just, well, wow, I can see the Great Rift, or it's so well defined, it's bright. And you know what an amateur astronomer means when he says bright, right? I can barely see it, but, well, I'm not going to admit that. Uh, it looked like a huge burning rainbow. And that's not unusual for that or any other desert location. Prude Ranch is probably not the best one. But the bottom line is there's only so much you will ever get in this part of the country. And I don't, you know, seeing is a whole different thing. We're just talking about darkness and deep sky. It can be quite dark. Uh, the other single thing I'll say on that subject is my experience is that the truly dark locations in the world don't look like you think they ought to. Uh, I suspect here the skies look darker, velvetier, blacker a lot of times than they do in the truly dark locations. In the truly dark locations, the sky appears grayish. The, the bottom line is how faint can you see with the unaided eye? And I don't think you'll ever approach that east of the Mississippi. But we keep trying. Time for maybe one or two more. Way in the back. What did he tell me to do to respect Cassegrain? Oh, flocking. Uh, that's a controversial uh, subject in the schmidt Cassegrain world. People have been known to challenge each other to fight. After a few drinks, nevertheless, over that subject, my personal feeling is that it's more trouble than it's worth. And if I had $10 from every person who said they would flock their inside of their Schmidt Cassegrain and dripped paint on the primary mirror and started uh, crying, I wouldn't have to be asking you guys for $10. One more. One more. Come on, somebody's got to ask a last question. I'm not going to leave here until somebody asks one more. Way in the back. Um, I'm interested in this uh, upcoming book of yours about the Yes. In the minute or two that we have left, I can't tell you a whole lot, but what I will say uh, is two things are most important for you being able to see deep sky objects from light polluted areas. Keep ambient light out of your eyes. You can't do anything about how bright the sky is, that's life. But if you can at least block out the light shining into your eyes from your neighbor's porch light, your eyes will be able to at least obtain a modicum of dark adaption, adaptation. Uh, shields, sheets, string tarps up, make your son hold up a piece of cardboard until he starts crying. Uh, all those things will work. The other thing is most people tend to associate deep sky viewing with low powers. Uh, even in the country that's not always a good thing, but you will find, almost like magic, that when you search for M51 in the city at uh, 45 power, it's totally invisible and run it up to about 100, and many times you can actually see it. It may just be two extremely faint blobs, but it'll be there. And of course, I'll say it was bright and obvious. Uh, and I could go on and on, but the bottom line is it can be done by the buck. Or come up, up after the presentation is over and give your Uncle Rod $10. $10. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. <laughs>